Добре, ми тоді нікого не чекаємо, тоді я вас запрезентую. Це був плежер цю інтродукцію на Христі, коли ви вас на топіку про Jewish history and specifically in the topic of women's experience in the Holocaust, which was affected in poetry. And since we don't have this much time, we have only one hour, I suggest go to straight go straight to lecture. Uh, Christina, thank you so much for your uh, willingness to participate. And uh, if you are ready, we are ready to listen to you. Thank you, good evening, and thank you all for coming on the virtual lecture today. And I'm pleased and honored to accept the invitation of the Vilnius Jewish Library and thank Ms. Sasha for this precious opportunity to address the Lithuanian audience. And I want to express my sincere gratitude to the people of Lithuania for your incredible support of Ukraine, uh, because uh, I love Lithuania and I was happy to feel really at home being a tourist in your country before Russia's full-scale invasion. And I hope to visit Vilnius uh, again soon after our victory over racism. Uh, I wish also to thank the Ukrainian Association for Jewish Studies uh, for support of Ukrainian scholars members in the first months of this uh, full-scale war. And this talk is possible only because of incredible people in the armed forces of Ukraine who um, hold the sky for us day and night uh, by the cost of their uh, health and lives. Uh, today I'm going to speak about three powerful women's voices of the 20th century. The world famous poetesses of Jewish descent come from the Ukrainian lands. Uh, they are a Polish poetess Zuzana Ginchanka and Argentinian writer Alejandra Pizarnik from Rivne, then Rivne, along with the German poetess Rosa Slender from Chernitsi, then Chernovitz, uh, who expressed their female identity and traumatic experiences, experience of the Holocaust uh, through their poetry. And just to give you a, like a, a small sign point, this talk will be divided on three parts dedicated to each heroine and a brief conclusive part in the end. Uh, so here I'll try to share with you my discoveries, my interpretation of the poetry from the research done in to, uh, 2019. And in the next hour or less, a bit more, um, we'll be talking around the following questions, and then I'll try to uh, switch on my presentation. Um, I hope you see it. Not yet. Oh, um, okay. Just a second. Mm -hmm. And now? Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, great. Uh, so um, we'll be talking around uh, the next, uh, like the following questions. Uh, how do the Jewish female writers, Jewish poetesses, write about their personal experience of the Holocaust and their female identities? Mm -hmm. uh, what languages do they seek for in order to express the in, uh, like inexpressible experience of the genocide? And how does the poetry act as the medium of cultural memory of the Holocaust and what memory it produces? Uh, so, and you'll notice on the next slide, um, here is a map of modern Ukraine. And you see uh, two Ukrainian cities, uh, which are the object of this today's discussion. Um, as I'm looking for some connection uh, with the territory of Ukraine, uh, I won't mention any many more cities, uh, in which our heroines lived, like Lviv, Warsaw, New York, Dusseldorf, and so on. So uh, here you may see how many names these two cities have. Like has, uh, had, uh, uh, they are Yiddish, Polish, German, Armenian, uh, uh, and many more. So this name reflects uh, the multicultural uh, core of these territories. Uh, in uh, you know uh, the upper part, uh, it's uh, Rivne. Rivne was part of Bolin, uh, a famous, like well-known uh, historical region, and um, the lower part, Chernovitz, was a part of uh, the uh, of Bukovina, also a big historical region, uh, and um, 
uh, both regions are regarded as uh, like uh, the borderlands, the territory of multiculturalism, and uh, these uh, places are what uh, what they were uh, in times when uh, our heroines uh, live, uh, was born and lived there or originated from uh, this city. Uh, and uh, let's begin uh, with uh, Zana Ginchanka, uh, uh, the Polish renowned and even called poetess. The revival of memory and public interest to her biography and her legacy uh, has sparked in the second half of the 20th century. And, uh, uh, and uh, Zuzana Polina Ginsburg, his uh, full name, uh, was born in uh, Kyiv and spent her childhood in Rivne, in, um, uh, in her grandmother's uh, house. Uh, the city then, the city was called Rivne because it was part of Poland. Uh, and uh, it has a large, uh, it had a large uh, share of Jewish population. Uh, and uh, Zuzana came from a uh, Russian speaking uh, Jewish family, but uh, like uh, attended the Polish gymnasium in Rovna, uh, Pol Polish uh, uh, school. And um, then uh, it's believed that um, she chose consciously uh, the Polish language as her primary language. And later on, Zuzana lived in Lviv and Warsaw. And in the interval period, she was close uh, to the um, quite famous uh, group of like modernist psych Polish poets uh, uh, titled Skamander. Um, and she contributed here in Warsaw, she contributed to the popular Polish magazines such as Wiadomości Literacji, or um, Skamander, Szpilki, uh, which is translated as Pins, uh, and so on. And Zuzanna is uh, the author of the Solai Lifetime Poetry Collections. You may see it uh, on the screen. Um, uh, this uh, uh, collection is titled Od Centaurus, or about Centaurus, and it was published in 1936. Uh, and uh, this Solai collection uh, become, has uh, had become uh, a literary sensation uh, uh, of this time. And at the age of 27, uh, Zuzanna was arrested, detained, and executed in the Gestapo in most likely 1944, shortly before the end of the war, um, as uh, she, she was killed as a Jew. So, uh, uh, among our mm -hmm. heroines, uh, Zuzanna didn't survive the Holocaust, but her poetry did. And in my opinion, the tragedy of the genocide should be considered as the key to her creativity, to her legacy, her biography, and her identity. Uh, as uh, Zuzanna's poetry uh, imminently brings the past tragedy closer to the present, closer to our days. So the Holocaust is a background of Ginchanka's most renowned poem, the Testament mm -hmm. Anonymous Moria, written in 1942, which uh, I'll be focusing um, on now. Uh, and uh, as uh, I put it, uh, transcending beyond the confines of the genre and the uh, boundaries of private experience. Uh, this poem belongs to the universal memory of the Holocaust and affects both symbolic and physical realities. Uh, for the better understanding of the poem, it's necessary to remind about the Horace's Ode, um, it's called uh, 3.30, where, um, uh, uh, where he writes the following lines. Um, I have crafted a monument more less than than bronze and loftier than the royal pile of the pyramids. I'll not totally perish, um, he wrote uh, in Latin, non omnis moria, uh, and much of me will survive. Uh, so using uh, this Horace's uh, solemn non omnis moria um, in the ironic way as a kind of sign of the European classic culture and metaphorical spring war, uh, Ginchanka transforms uh, this Latin phrase into a caustic but passionate proof of uh, her a real Jewish existence. I'll not perish, uh, the lyric heroine asserts and recalls the personal stuff um, in this uh, 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 first verse uh, as uh, in, in the way how people usually talk about above. Um, non omnis moria, my grand estate, tablecloth, meadows, invincible wardrobe, castles, acres of bedsheets, funny woven linens, dresses, colorful dresses will survive me. I leave no ears. 
And uh, this manner elevates the significance of private life history. And uh, at the same time, addresses the popular, very popular and dangerous stereotype uh, of the Jewish affluence. And so in this dance reflection, uh, Zuzana appeals to the attributes of womanhood, um, stereotypical clothing and child rearing, uh, as she had not too little time uh, to enjoy her life and her femininity. So uh, in this record, the poem can also be considered as a crisis diary, where she makes a noteworthy gesture. And in this, sec uh, in this second uh, verse, um, you may see the following lines. Uh, so let your hands rummage through cheap things. You, Homin's wife from Lvov, you mother of a Volksdeutscher. Um, in the original text, uh, text is in Polish, um, she left only the first letter, letter um, G, J, uh, and a period in lieu of an adjective Żydowski, that is translated as Jewish from Polish. Uh, so this gesture can reveal a deeply intimate fact that marked her fluctuations between the Jewish identity and uh, an attempt to destroy the own Jewishness using the mask of a Pole or an Armenian because uh, she fled Lvov um, in the middle of the war with the false passport of an Armenian Maria Danilova. Uh, so uh, this gesture can also mean uh, an attempt to survive and encrypting and hiding her identity. So actually, no one have an idea of what exactly this gesture meant for, for the poetess. Uh, at the moment when uh, uh, she was writing these lines, but um, editors symbolically return um, this, uh, like uh, this letter, this uh, uh, word, uh, and uh, it, it is perceived like a symbolic return of uh, Zuzanna, her Jewish identity, by adding an encrypted word to the uh, reprints of uh, the poem. And this second, uh, second verse um, is a story of betrayal. As, we, as we, you, you may see, uh, it was Zofia Hominova, Homin's wife, um, uh, a hostess of the Lvo, uh, Lvo apartments, uh, who betrayed the Jewish lodger Zuzana to the Nazis three times in a row. And Hominova's conduct is uh, like uh, confirms uh, the well known Hannah Arendt's idea of the banality of evil, uh, uh, because this evil was like motivated by personal cruelty and the desire for personal gain. Uh, Zuzanna wrote the poem on the piece of, of paper and after her death, it was uh, preserved uh, quite miraculously uh, by her friend. And later the poem had been used as the evidence in a trial against the Nazi collaborators, uh, Zofia Hominova and uh, her son. Uh, and uh, Bojana Shalkros, a Polish scholar, ascribes uh, the values of a memory artifact to each piece of the text about the Holocaust originated from this time, from the time uh, of the uh, Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, and she called text like, uh, a text like No Nomis Moriar um, as a precarium. And here you, here you see uh, the definition, because uh, it's quite uh, interesting. Uh, for uh, an, uh, for the analysis of uh, these uh, sorts of poems, uh, in her turn, attempts uh, the uh, Susanna's uh, Susanna's verse, uh, Susanna's poem is uh, both a textual Holocaust relic or trace, uh, and an archived poetic text capable of bearing witness engages the dual status of survival and death characteristics of precarity. Uh, in in this integrity, uh, the poem produces cultural memory of the war experiences and the Holocaust, as well as captures the instantaneity of human life. Christina, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, uh, we see the same slide on your presentation. Uh, if, if it has to be like this. I'm sorry. I'm very I'm sorry for interruption. But uh, we really would like to see. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Okay, then I have to. Do you see it now? Yeah. It's still the same. Not... The same. And this? No? No. I'm sorry, I don't know what, what's going on. Now, now it works, yes. Let's see. I, I'll try, try again. <sighs> Mm 
Okay. And do you see it now? Another yeah. slide? Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> sorry that okay. <laughs> too much. Okay, so here you can see these uh, questions. Uh, then uh, uh, you, you see, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this map, oh, uh, I'm a bit confused. Really? We remember everything you said. So uh, just go on. Uh, okay, so so uh, I'll show you all this, and uh, this is yeah, this is come on there. Um, the first uh, poetry collection, Zuzanna, like uh, an original cover. Uh, this is the text, and this is uh, a definition of uh, precarium. I think it's very important. Term, so I put it on the screen. I hope you you see it now. Yeah. Yes, we do. Great. Okay. So uh, where where are I? Uh, it, it needs. Uh, okay. Uh, so um, and returning to the poem, I think uh, I can return to it once again. Um, I'd like to say to continue that uh, this. Uh, in this, in its integrity, the poem uh, produces cultural memory of the war experiences, cultural memory of the war and the Holocaust, and uh, at the same time captures this instantaneity of uh, human life. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, it acts as, um, I don't know, to some extent, a psychoanalytical attempt of self-reflection on one hand, and a sort of crisis diary on the other hand. Mm, and the, par the paradox is that, uh, in, uh, in my view, that uh, the traditional testament is to a certain extent an applied judge. So a uh, traditional will is a document of a prudent, like pathetic style, and uh, it has um, an intention uh, to, um, uh, I don't know, to, uh, to manage life after your uh, like uh, after your uh, death but uh, in uh, the poet uh, the poem of Susanna Kinchanka um, it is different uh, and according uh, to Elida Asman it's a, a famous culture member scholar uh, the gesture of writing uh, is a change in medium and simultaneously an ambiguity of cultural memory so in this record Kinchanka poem conducts an ironic dialogue with the European literary tradition as um, uh, she um, appeals to Horace's um, ode, yeah, and uh, of course to the Polish, the law of uh, the Polish wheels uh, written by the prominent Polish poet, uh, poets like Jan Kochanowski, Juliusz uh, Słowacki, Adam Mickiewicz, and Julian Antuvin, who was uh, uh, one of the most um, uh, known po uh, poets uh, of the 20th century and um, a close friend of Zuzana Kinchanka, by the way. Uh, so in, in this, uh, like, uh, in this um, record, I called Anonymous Moriar even a cultural trigger project that maintains the cultural dialogue from the perspective of this uh, Skamandar's modernist consciousness uh, with their reverence for classical antiquity. Mm, and uh, the last lines are a dramatic parody of Slovatsky because this uh, poem um, uses uh, the formal structure of uh, the wheel of Julius Slovatsky. Mm, uh, this wheel uh, is called Testament Moi, one of the most, uh, my testament, one of the most known uh, Polish wheels, Polish poetic uh, testaments. Mm, and so, uh, Julius uh, Slovatsky is one of um, like three. Um, uh, greatest poets, prophets of Poland. Um, he uh, lived in uh, the 19th century and uh, Ginchanka plays with the formal structure of his will um, because in Slovakia, a poet and servant of his people says that his legacy continues to impact people uh, and transform them from bread eaters uh, into strong minded, uh, like freedom loving people. So let me read out. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, these um, uh, uh, some lines uh, from uh, this uh, will of uh, uh, Slovatsky. Uh, 
uh, but after me remains where the fateful force that of the views in life adorned by my, my forehead tall, but it will press you when I die without remorse. So that bread eaters, you become sheer angels all. And in a stark contrast with this pretext, uh, with, uh, with the uh, will of Slovatsky, Ginchanka describes the reversal, uh, like the reverse metamorphosis, because after mourning her, as we uh, may see in uh, this uh, text on the screen, uh, yesterday's friends started looking for jewelry and money in her belongings. And while they are tearing up pillows and quills, clouds of love clued on by her blood, sticking to their hands, and transfiguring them into bloody angels. So suddenly the image has a drastically different meaning than in Slovatsky, because in Slovatsky we see how people like uh, simple, ordinary people, bread eaters, um, are turning into angels, into something uh, higher. Uh, and in uh, Zuzana Ginchanka, it, it has a radically different meaning. And this torn band line uh, linens and pillows that anonymize the torn soul of the speaker, of, uh, of the lyric subject, and her ruined life. So in the, uh, I think, uh, in the second lyric dimension, the grotesque scene of transfiguration is projected on the desire for revenge that seems to erase traitors not only from life, but also from life after death, because uh, it's um, about uh, weird creatures, not, not um, not genuine angels, right? And uh, these, uh, these angels from Susanna's poetry are closer to um, de uh, to demons, to some like um, inferno types, uh, uh, I don't know, vampires uh, fr uh, like Frankenstein uh, and so on. So Susanna Ginchanka paints these paradoxical images of angels, which are the pro product of their own greed and anti-Semitism. And uh, they literally uh, glued from fluff and blood of the victim. That is, they are much closer to uh, the demons, to the evil, than to these uh, biblical messengers of God. So um, I think uh, it's about it uh, for this part. And um, uh, on the next slide, you uh, on this slide, you may see uh, one of, uh, I, I think, uh, the first a poetry collection uh, published in Ukraine. It, it was published in uh, 2017. Mm, uh, it's a bilingual edition, uh, so uh, you may see uh, Polish originals and trans, uh, translated uh, poems uh, translated by uh, a famous Ukrainian uh, scholar uh, Yaroslav Polishchuk. And um, I, I think uh, it's uh, very good. Mm -hmm very good uh, publication uh, because it's uh, greatly like perfectly illustrated by these collages and uh, and so on now so to recap my <laughs> this part of presentation i'd say that um, i interpret that I'm sorry uh, uh, i suggest the triple role of this poem of Susanna Kinchanka in the world cultural history, recognizing it as uh, at the same time a uh, multi gender document, a will, a testimony, a crisis diary, um, the court evidence, of course, uh, and an artifact of memory of the Holocaust, um, I mean, this precarium. So uh, finally, a rhetorical gesture writing uh, is the main way to maintain memory of the Shoah, uh, like available for Zuzanna Ginchanka. Um, at the moment of the war. Uh, okay, and in the second part, this uh, in this part, uh, I want to put the spotlight on Rose of Slender uh, and her poetry. And the epigraph you might, I hope you see uh, on the screen, to write means to live, to live through, uh, is taken from uh, Auslander's memoirs. Uh, and I also want to say a few words about her bi biography. Uh, so uh, Rosa Slander was, um, or Rosalia Beatrice Scherzer, uh, is a prominent uh, German poetess of Jewish descent, uh, writing in German and English. Um, and uh, she's uh, the award winner of uh, 20 poetry uh, book collections. Uh, 
uh, and first of which uh, the rainbow in German, uh, in, uh, like appeared in uh, German in 1930 and was destroyed during the World War II. Uh, um, Rosalia Rose uh, was born in today's Ukrainian city of Chernivtsi, as I mentioned, and then Chernovich, and uh, she spent early years in Bukovina uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, this is um, this is uh, this uh, special um, frontier region um, between Ukraine and today's uh, today's uh, uh, Romania. And in 1919 uh, through 1920, Rosalia studied philosophy in Chernovitz and Vienna. Yeah. Then uh, she and her spouse moved to the United States. Uh, they uh, received uh, American citizenship. Uh, then uh, they uh, returned to Ukraine to, to then Chernovitz um, uh, to look after uh, Rosalia's uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen mother, and uh, they lost the citizenship uh, of uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, then in 1931, um, uh, they returned. And during the Second World War, uh, Rose Oslander uh, survived uh, the Chernovitz ghetto. Uh, and uh, in this ghetto, nearly 19. 19 percent of uh, percents of Jewish population uh, perished in the Holocaust. So uh, later on, uh, Rosalia fled the Soviet occupied Chernobyl um, in 1946 and lived in the United States again while writing in English only. Uh, so she survived the Holocaust but stopped writing uh, in German for several years uh, afterwards. And in 1956, she reverted to writing in German. Uh, then in 1963 she went to Vienna and two years later moved to Dusseldorf and uh, where she died in 1988. So she had a, a long and um, quite adventurous uh, life with many cities uh, where she lived and uh, many experiences, uh, but uh, also uh, she lived uh, through the Holocaust. Uh, and in uh, her expressive and concise poetry, uh, she reflects upon her Jewish identity and culture. Uh, her childhood years in Bukovina, a role of the language, uh, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the Shoah catastrophism. Uh, and uh, her poetry is deeply uh, ambiguous, deeply co like internally contradictory, uh, and uh, permitted with a, like, a struggle of despair and hope darkness and light, death and life. Um, and traces of traumatic experiences can be uh, found in the uh, recurring motifs of the Odyssey, the loss of a mother, uh, groundlessness, uh, fundamental symbolic images of phoenix, uh, fire and ashes, blood, uh, night, uh, roses, uh, stars, uh, as well as the language crisis described by many, many scholars. Um, as uh, after the Holocaust, uh, this issue of communication became um, particularly acute, uh, and uh, it was uh, defined succinctly as uh, by Theodore Adorno as impossible after Auschwitz. Uh, and it, it was particularly acute for German-speaking poets of Jewish descent, uh, who faced the unspeakability of their experiences uh, in natural uh, language. So the inner conflict between the mother tongue, which became the language of mothers, as Paul Celan um, David forced Rosa Slender to write exclusively in English for a decade, for almost a decade. And in her poetry, uh, 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 this is a picture from uh, then Chernovitz, then Chernitsi, as we say in Ukrainian. Uh, an issue of space is an important part of her poetic reflection. Uh, she writes about the landscape that created me. And here, Bukovina, where she was born and raised, plays a critical part because Bukovina as a transitional land uh, between Ukraine and Romania, which is located be below Galicia and other uh, well-known uh, historical region. Uh, Bukovina, uh, the name Bukovina uh, comes from Buk, which is a beech tree in Ukrainian. So it's literally like a, a region, a land of uh, beech uh, forests. And um, uh, it's a logical thing that poets, survivors of the Holocaust uh, literally uh, 
like deal with the, their sense of loss of homeland uh, because they are uh, connections they are ties with home uh, with this feeling of a uh, sense of belonging we are cut uh, both in the emotional and spatial senses uh, in Auslander's interpretation culture memory and remembrance of the holocaust has this um, distinct special character and the Shoah experience is oftentimes articulated through an ambiguous topos of um, you know, happy Bukovina and um, like Bukovina Ghetto. And this happy Bukovina, she, descri she describes this uh, topos in a poem, Bukovina Third, uh, just a line from uh, um, it. Four languages, songs in four languages, people who understand each other. It's like also, uh, uh, this also has some language uh, basis, uh, this description. Uh, of her happy land, uh, land of uh, happy ch uh, childhood. And in her poetry, the happy Bukovina can be associated with the swell of nest, uh, what's important. So in the dedication, for, for example, in the, the dedication to Paul Celan, another, another uh, uh, renowned uh, poet survivor of the Holocaust, uh, this uh, swallow uh, like a, uh, is a symbol of revival in home. So. Mm, uh, in this record, as I put it, uh, the Holocaust broke the single territory of existence, the single um, uh, area of life uh, of the uh, poetess of uh, Rosa Slander and other poets on these uh, two uh, territories, two spaces, uh, space, uh, a lost idyllic land of childhood and the land of suffering, which is uh, in the physical um, uh, in terms of physical uh, reality or, or geography, it is uh, the single, the one, uh, it is one uh, territory. And uh, the latter, this land of suffering is expressed through the archetypal plot of a Jewish exile. Uh, this fears of deportation and the irretrievable uh, loss as well as ghetto horror. So in the poem Chernivtsi, uh, Chernovitz history in a nutshell, the history of Chernivtsi is in fact told as a process of recollecting the family history, uh, which ends abruptly. And the transformation of city, this city into the open wound, a site generating traumatic memory, constantly generated for those uh, who survived. Mm, so Auslander tells about uh, the idyllic nature, multilingualism of her motherland, where five languages um, were spoken, the Austro-German high culture in times of the dual monarchy, Hasidic culture, and the Soviet Bolsheviks uh, invasion, uh, which symbolically ends with the ghetto period when even God resigned. And this is also um, a concise metaphor. Uh, where a Nietzsche's uh, motif of uh, the death of God speaks of a loss of the uh, like divinity in the face of catastrophe, which made it difficult to keep the face in the transcendent. So each time the imaginary return to Bukovina and renews both traumatic and happy memories, uh, a sense of return to the roots. So after all, um, it's now uh, it's not uh, like a coincidence that during her life. Uh, 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 Auslander writes about her own imaginary grave in Bukovina. Uh, uh, in this attempt to return forever uh, to this land and grow into the lost land, as in the poem Will. Um, I didn't put um, many poems on the screen because uh, it would be uh, too much uh, text, too much uh, uh, slides, but um, I, I tried to uh, recall some of uh, the most prominent, uh, most important in my view, uh, text. So, uh, painfully experiencing uh, her detachment or rather um, like irreversible loss of the language and the motherland and literally um, like uh, she, she, wrote, uh, she, uh, she writes that uh, she uh, carries her country, uh, her country in uh, her pocket. Uh, Rosa Slander finds it in words, in language and turns words onto space. So in my view, her poetry indeed, not metaphorically, embodies the Heidegger's concept of a conception of the language, uh, like, you know, a language is the house, the abode of uh, being. And um, the, the word becomes uh, the, the way and tool for construction of uh, uh, the own world for Auslander. So as it, Adorno states it, for a man who no longer has a homeland, writing becomes a place to live. 
And this, in the next poem, Nicht October, uh, Nicht November, that is not October, not November, uh, the fundamentality of language, which is the only one to enable the purification of the human soul and hope for future, is emphasized. Uh, Auslander tells us about the autumn of war, which is described as bitter, um, frosty and rusty, and which gives people the same characteristics. Uh, and she, she calls for the invention of the new calendar uh, and the new language, literally in order to start all over again for the mankind. Uh, while uh, in this sense of, uh, again, to paraphrase Heidegger, the previous language become not the abode, but a coffin of being. You must invent a new calendar, another, uh, another alphabet, a language of redefinition, for time has fallen, fallen into the unimaginable, and we are fallen uh, with it. Uh, and at the same time, the dumb Holocaust survivors uh, who have literally become speechless because of the tragedy experienced, uh, they need to speak until they are alive. So uh, the, it's also a paradox of uh, witness. Uh, so uh, after all this, uh, after um, all experiences, only their testimonies preserve the memory engraved in the language. And the memory of Bukovina involves the loss of a mother, a recurring uh, traumatic motif of the Auslander's poetry. Uh, her recollection includes metamorphosis and metampsychosis uh, as uh, the methods for transcendent communication with uh, the mother, at the, the voice of the ancestors. Uh, and uh, like uh, in this, I think it's one of, um, most uh, one of the central po uh, poems uh, in this record uh, when we are talking about the uh, image of uh, the mother for Auslander. Because we, uh, uh, this is uh, like Meine Nachtigall, name uh, in English, uh, My Nightingale. And she, uh, she writes that my mother was a dear once, the golden brown eyes, the grace, remind with her from her time as dear. Uh, here she was half angel, half human. The middle was mother. When I asked her what she would, uh, what she would have liked to become, she said, a nightingale. Now she is a nightingale. Night after night, I listen to her in the garden of my sleepless dream. She sings the ancestors' tian. She sings the old Austria. She sings the mountains and the beach. Rouse of Bukovina. Lullabies. She sings to me night after night, my nightingale in the garden of my sleepless dream. And speaking about another key discourse of the mother, like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, another, uh, uh, th this big uh, part of her poetic reflection, um, the stark contrast between fatherland as the land of the forefathers and motherland appearing as a word play uh, has been uh, like has been highlighted in a poem motherland or a motherland and uh, i hope you see it it's a uh, very brief but um uh contains uh, much meaning um and uh, uh as we uh, as we may uh, suppose the father symbolizes her like jewish roots a connection with um, jewish culture uh, Hasidism, mythology, Jewish mythology, and Kabbalistic philosophy, where fatherland is uh, like the memory vision of the Jewish land, a kind of Israel in Bukovina. Um, and it has its illustration in uh, other different poems of uh, Auslander. But the mother is the one who taught Rose the German language. And after the catastrophe, motherland appears at the solar and tangible space of language and culture. Uh, it exists only in language. Mm, and a special mystical connection between the language and the mother has a feminist connotation, as I, uh, uh, as I see it. Uh, so the poet has, uh, takes away the Old Testament's meaning of the word as God the Father and transmits it to the mother as, um, you know, the mother's language, uh, mother tongue, um, enabling it to create a human mosaic. Uh, to transform parts into a whole and complete the, uh, and complete uh, the meanings. We see it like uh, I changed myself into myself from one moment moment to the next, splintered to pieces, 
on the way of words. Uh, mother tongue assembles me, human mosaic. And yet another science of the Holocaust that the author's text and the uh, um, Auslander's reflection uh, is the construction of antinomic images of the others in an attempt to start a like, timeless polylog between the dead, the survivors uh, who cast their voice for the dead, and the murderers. According to Catherine Bauer, Auslander as the poet, uh, poet as survivor of the Shoah, likewise other Jewish German writers, acts as an agent of memory maintaining a sort of mediation, like uh, this, uh, I don't know, improvised intergenerational dialogue. And by giving a voice to the victim, the poets inevitably engages in communication as part of the collective subjectivity. So badly experienced and percep a perceptible belonging to the Jewish people and the strengthening of the Jewish identity has also the flip side of the coin since it's followed by a sense of guilt for their own survival and for their own future uh, in which there is no, uh, there are no relatives, no friends uh, who didn't survive the Holocaust. Uh, so uh, this feeling, as uh, I hope you know uh, about the fate of um, Paul Celan, this feeling uh, likely costed him uh, life because uh, he uh, didn't endure this uh, sense of. Um, like of being the only survivor in his family. Uh, so, uh, uh, and moving moving forward, um, uh, I'd like to uh, to put an uh, emphasis on the role of uh, poetic associ associations, uh, which um, uh, help uh, uh, Auslander like uh, to, to give this voice uh, to the uh, to give this voice to the all uh, parties all uh, participants of this intergenerational uh, dialogue mm. uh, she uh, often uh, uses zoomorphic floral and mythological images uh, and she has it's, uh, uh, she has uh, like her own um, system of these images um then, oh, then uh, I'll, um, okay, I thought of uh, talking about the poem Blind, Blind, Summer, Blind Summer, but I, I has no text on the screen also. Um, because uh, this Blind Summer is also a very uh, important poem uh, for understanding of uh, this uh, reflection of the Holocaust uh, uh, in, uh, in the poetry of uh, Rose of Slander. Uh, so I'd like to give some more detailed interpretation of this poem uh, and just uh, like to, to tell you about uh, its content. Uh, uh, in, uh, like uh, this text uh, tells about uh, the summer of 1941. So uh, that's, uh, that's exactly why uh, the picture is perverted because in stark contrast to the someone's unattainable summer, she mentioned uh, this someone's unattainable summer. Uh, and in stark contrast to this picture, uh, Auslander um, uh, depicted uh, uh, depicts uh, uh, her own summer, which is blind, ashy, and bitter. Uh, and it thinks of uh, like a rotten, uh, like na nazi a scent of roses instead of uh, incense. Uh, and uh, it's an iron bridge instead of land um, among her uh, images on which the feet of uh, the rescued in the modern Noah Ark had to step. And here the Ark turned into a ghetto, a medium of the modern catastrophe, and like the former shelter, the former Ark shelter in time of the ancient catastrophe. And in this text, um, Bird image plays also an important part because we see the Old Testament's white dove as a harbinger of rebirth and the exit from the ark, which is impossible to wait, and the recurrent image of this valley, which lost its way south, uh, where the road home is. Uh, so it's quite a, um, a tragic poem uh, about uh, the tragic summer uh, start of the war. Mm, and uh, here the author returns uh, the image of fire, like uh, defiled uh, in the Holocaust, 
uh, uh, she returns uh, this fire to her people through the archetype of the phoenix. Phoenix signifies this, uh, the burned people who are resurrected to life from the ashes in the new world. And phoenix is one of the uh, really recurrent uh, um, images in her poetry about this uh, reflection of the Holocaust. Uh, okay, and I have... Uh, um, okay, I have many more uh, poems here, but uh, um, I'll mention uh, mentioned, um, the uh, collection The Forbidden Tree, uh, and uh, we'll move uh, forward, uh, because this is a complicated and profound collection of, uh, which is full uh, exactly of this mythological and historical context and centered around the recurring image of a tree, which can be uh, like uh, considered as the family tree, the sphero tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil from the Eden, and so forth. And therefore, the author um, Portas refers to the Jewish culture memory, in particular Kabbalistic and biblical symbols, and to the memory of the family and generation memory, like intergenerational memory, as well as the memory of all mankind. So uh, this is um, quite, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, so, uh, essential uh, poetry collection uh, in terms of uh, this return to the Jewish uh, cultural uh, context and uh, Jewish roots for um, uh, for Iceland. Uh, and uh, I'll stop here. So um, a quick recap of the main points of this section. Uh, I said that Rose Auslander's female experience of the Holocaust is both the matter of testimony and the matter of reflection. Um, and she focuses on reflection and is straightforward in the references to the Jewish people through, uh, though she tends to depict universal motifs uh, as well. Uh, and in her vision, the Holocaust remembrance is a tool of survival in the post-war era, which is important for, for us. We, have, we are having, uh, in Ukraine, we are having new war and we uh, are thinking of this, uh, of, uh, the memory as uh, also a tool for, uh, like for moving, uh, in, uh, moving towards the future. So, uh, Auslander <clears throat> considers memory, considers this, um, how to say, connection to the uh, connection with memory as um, perhaps central, uh, central um, element for survival. And. Uh, the mothers, this uh, also uh, uh, have to uh, mention this, uh, the issue of mother tongue, the issue of language, which is uh, central for Auslander's uh, reflection, uh, and an image of mother uh, who died in the Holocaust and is uh, salient for her poetry too. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, in the end, uh, her reflection and re recollection of uh, uh, of the memory of this um, of her past uh, has a distinct special dimension uh, with a focus with a uh, uh, clear connection to uh, uh, like uh, to uh, today's Ukrainian Bukovina. And the final part of my presentation is devoted to the mortal pathos, mortal tone of Alejandro Pizarnik, Alejandra Pizarnik's poetry as a specific manifestation of female traumatic experience. Mm. On the background of Susanna Ginchanka and Rosa Oslander, who were uh, like victims of the Holocaust, one may be uh, at first surprised by mentioning uh, of Alejandra Pizarni here, because she uh, she's one of the cult uh, Latin American poets, um, poetesses of the 20th century, and uh, her okay. Uh, her Jewish parents immigrated from the Ukrainian city of Rimne, uh, then Rimne, as I mentioned, in the interwar years. So Alejandra was born in Argentina uh, in 1936, two years after the immigration of her parents and didn't observe the World War II uh, like with uh, her own eyes. But her biographers believe that she had never publicly associated herself with her Jewish roots. And... Uh, Moreover, like she resisted sharply any attempts to determine the factors prompting her to write, as uh, leading uh, scholars of her legacy uh, state. But in spite of that, the Pizarniks lost the majority of their relatives, um, perhaps um, 
nearly all relatives uh, in Ukraine during the Holocaust. And I suggest that this fact uh, um, like, uh, could not be of secondary importance. And Pizarnik had a, a complicated identity, some mental disorders, including this, uh, depression, the clinical di diagnosis of uh, um, a, a split personality, uh, and drug addiction, as well as her poetry is full of the immigrant feelings, uh, immigrant experience, uh, dreams, um, death, the conception of the lost childhood. Um, uh, and all this moved me to research some of her poetry in the context of the tragedy of uh, European Jewry and female traumatic experience. So, um, um, oh, huh. Here is the epigraph to this part. Uh, it's quite important for me uh, to mention it uh, because uh, it, it's taken from uh, the poem of Nelly Zaks. And just to give uh, like more context of the, uh, the time, Zaks is a, an outstanding German writer of Jewish descent and Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, she died on the Polish Celian, her close friend's funeral day. And his, uh, in his turn, as um, I uh, recalled, I, uh, I mentioned, uh, Celian is one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, and he also hailed from Bukovina, from Chernovitz. Um, he, so he, he committed a suicide in Paris, likely because couldn't uh, endure the, the burdens of the past of this uh, experience, uh, this memory of the Holocaust. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this, uh, this uh, epigraph resonates um, perfectly with. Uh, the general uh, idea of this uh, third uh, section. And um, when it comes to Alejandra's biography, it's um, bright and ambiguous. Being a kid, she had to change her name from the unusual Alejandra. Um, I think it was Alexandra in its first edition. Um, and common Jewish Yiddish name Bluma, uh, namely Flower. She was called at home to Flora. Uh, which is the more common uh, one in the Spanish-speaking environment in Argentina. Uh, and um, Alejandra's mother considered um, her, like her sister, as more beautiful and criticized Alejandra's appearance. So Alejandra Flora had issues with the acceptance of her body um, in adulthood. As an adult, while in Paris, where she studied at the Sorbonne and befriended Julia Cortázar and uh, many other uh, well-known artists, uh, she experienced otherness and even the alienation for the first time in her life as an Argentine Eastern European Jewish woman. Uh, and this might have unexpectedly renewed her identity connection um, uh, exactly with the Jewish culture and impacted on her sense of self. So having changed this uh, uh, Yiddish speaking, Spanish uh, speaking and French speaking environments in her lifetime, she has a language issue cutting across all her poetry. Uh, it's um, uh, to some extent it's similar to the language, uh, uh, a kind of uh, obsession with language uh, in Rosa Oslander, but in Pizarnik it becomes uh, even more acute. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, an important uh, thing is also that she suffered physically from this, this tragic inability to express the unspoken and from dissatisfaction with the limits of the natural language and trying to break free from the pressure of language. Um, uh, Alejandra comes to the concise poetry full of emblematic words um, like um, elixirs and semantic gaps uh, loaded with a plethora of meanings. Uh, and uh, here in the poem Ashes, it's, uh, um, it's translated from Spanish. Uh, she refers to the words to wake the dead, uh, like to the act of naming, which in, uh, the, uh, in the Bible is synonymous with possession. Um, uh, but uh, as we may see at the la uh, last lines, uh, uh, she uh, like um, uh, ends, she ends this uh, poem with the confession of the aimlessness of her communication because of the absence of an addressee, a person whom she is in love with. Uh, another loudly articulated theme of Pizarnik's poetry is the frequently mentioned attachment with the lost childhood too, uh, which in some regards might connect her with uh, the Jewish Ukrainian past. Uh, I suggest, I suppose. Uh, the issue of childhood is a recurrent, um, recurring 
image of um, uh, linked to her feeling of wandering and a ruthlessness. Mm, it's also resulted in the desire of artistic orphanhood, another complex and uh, unusual uh, phenomenon uh, of the uh, author's like inner life and her creativity, uh, which is an attempt to break away from the insulated family cycle, which still cared about the Jewish tradition, Jewish identity, and for the sake of poetic solitude and the more like more productive state of, uh, of the artistic orphanhood. And having changed her name to Alejandra, she tried to fit into this new Argentine identity, which however didn't become imminent, as we can read in her books, uh, read in, in her uh, poems. Uh, so the poetess uh, often addresses herself by the given name, as if trying to hide from the Jewish past and literally be born for a new existence, like in a poem only sign. Uh, it's very brief. Please, Alejandra, open your eyes, kind of the light of birth. Uh, in Pazarnik's poetry, the imagery of childhood as a garden, metaphors of infanticide, and uh, this, uh, as I say, as I said, um, this orphanhood, and um, many of her images are uh, the images of infanticide. Uh, and also the image of a monstrous child prevail. And after uh, the real death of her father in 1966, when her literal image, like, this uh, psychoanalytic idea of orphanhood become real, Alejandra fall into the emotional crisis, which catalyzed and deepened the mortal discourse of her poetry. So uh, he, uh, she um, perceived uh, the real orphanhood a very, in a very difficult uh, way, uh, though uh, in um, the poetry, in her creativity, because she also uh, wrote uh, uh, prose, short, uh, short stories, uh, she uh, experienced um, this orphanhood in another way than in real life. Uh, um, likewise, another thorough motif of her poetry is the loss of self-integrity, not a metaphorical but a literal splitting uh, of the self into like numerous me and she, me and she and uh, uh, other pronouns. Uh, in the compressed poem time, the lyrical subject reflects on herself in terms of distance and multiplicity. Uh, um, it's also very brief. Uh, from childhood, I remember only blinding fear and the land that pulls me, um, I'm sorry, and the hand uh, that pulls me to my other shore. So uh, this uh, image of splitting, this image of uh, like multiple Alejandras, or I don't know, perhaps not only Alejandra's um, appear uh, in many of her, uh, of her poems, uh, especially these short, um, very short, very concise uh, ones. And also the figure of an exile, a traveler becomes a personal metaphor for uh, Alejandra, where it, it, it's expected, uh, because it's difficult um, uh, to, uh, to identify exactly what's behind this, but obviously her poetry generates um, something, something close to a mosaic person, the image from Rosa Slander's poetry, yeah? uh, human mosaic, uh, speaking of the complete absence, uh, like personal inability, uh, instability, um, personal instability, um, which resonate with the images of death. Uh, and the poetics of death, mortality, this um, um, mortal pathos, as I called it, uh, the poetics of absence characterize her writing and the very way, the very core, uh, um, uh, how uh, uh, she relates to the world, language, and uh, the self. And this emblematic of, and surrealistic images of death were a water shade of masks, um, night uh, mirrors, doppelgangers, and silence, which she considers as a synonym of the poetic language are the most commonly articulated. So many um, finds her writing just the variation of several th uh, themes. And um, in her brilliant experimental uh, cycle of 28 poems, Diana's Three, uh, Arbol de Diana, uh, she uses the image of shadow to manifest herself. For instance, in this poem on the screen, a poem under the number three, um, uh, the desert and the empty glass are quite clearly associated with the uh, unsuitability and sterility of the language, mental loneliness and introversion. Uh, like introversion. 
Uh, only the thirst, the silence, no encounters. Beware of me, my love. Beware of the silent traveler in this desert, of the traveler with the empty glass, and of her shadows, shadow. And in this cycle, um, Pizarnik gives herself many names that reveal her fragmentation and the pieces of this split personality. A hungry girl lost in a storm. I and who I was. Sleep walking on the corners of work now. No more sweet metaphor, um, meta, um, metamorphosis of a silky girl. So uh, these sorts of definitions uh, refer to the antisociality, perhaps uh, morbidity, only reason, and even might result from her real um, resistance to the socially desirable self-image. So interpreting the lyrical subject, Pizarnik, uh, um, Pizarnik is melancholic. Some scholars note that, note that uh, it's impossible to express melancholy in the words. So um, like words, uh, the natural language become uh, superfluous for the, uh, uh, for the author. And uh, the genetological uh, discourse um, of the poem, The Last Innocence, contains the recurrent motifs of the emotional insulation, alienation, the uh, sense of loneliness, uh, suicidal mood and the subjectivity of an exile, uh, a female traveler, as we, um, this um, this image or this self description appears uh, quite uh, frequently in her poetry. Uh, so, uh, 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 in, in this poem, in this uh, the less innocence, uh, we may see um, this. Um, uh, exacerbated uh, sense of the temporality of uh, Alejandra's stay or the lyric subjects uh, stay uh, here and um, it uh, like it prompts uh, this lyrical subject or this lyrical subjects um, to accelerate their depart uh, departure so it's like uh, a, rec a recurring uh, motifs of uh, her creativity too and um, sometimes mortal pathos of her poetry is too accentuated, like by an, Im uh, an image of a sleeping person um, eating the own heart. Um, it's a poem under, you see, the, under the number of uh, 32nd, um, Diana's three, or uh, like on the upper poem, uh, 34. Um, uh, we see is that the little traveler died explaining her death. Wise nostalgic animals visited her hidden body. Um, in my soul, in my mind, this uh, this short, this brief uh, poem, like I don't know, provokes uh, some uh, very special feelings. Um, so it's uh, quite powerful, as I think. Uh, and. Um, uh, continue my uh, general analysis. Uh, Alejandra Pizarnik straightforwardly writes that uh, the life serves her, and she's constantly um, like uh, grabbing the flame. She, she, she feels uh, that she grabs the flame. And this is a vision of life as the first continuation of someone's existence, despite um, her unwillingness. And the, the indivisible unity of uh, this thanatological, uh, melancholic, suicidal, surrealist, and other discourses, like related discourses, uh, turned her poetry into a mysterious manifesto of, of the complexity of human, uh, not even life, but human existence in these philosophic terms, in the philosophic sense. Uh, and the personal, uh, and it also manifests of the personal um, vulnerability in the face of the world, uh, in the face of uh, um, all uh, which exists. Uh, so, in my view, her Jewish childhood and uh, her immigrant background um, played a great role in her artistic and identity formation. And the perception of the Holocaust, during which all the Ukrainian relatives, uh, friends, uh, um, as uh, the families were like large uh, at the time, uh, they uh, all these people uh, were annihilated by Nazis. 
uh, and the alienation because of being uh, the Jew, uh, which the poets uh, poet has, uh, like uh, likely encountered in post-war continental Europe in France, um, for most, along with other factors, with um, bad health, uh, some family issues, uh, family um, weird family connections, uh, um, uh, relations with her mother, and so on. Uh, this, these factors inevitably resulted in the mortal and suicidal. A fatalistic spirit of her poetry and this uh, like um, this unity of, of feminist and tragic uh, I don't know discourses let's call it discourses so uh, Alejandro's writing reflects the complicated outlook of a woman uh, with multicultural background and that dramatic experience uh, of life uh, and summarizing this talk in general uh, I'd like to know that the poetry of three uh, female writers uh, represent their unique experiences, experiences of the war, the Holocaust, or experiences of uh, being a woman, uh, experiences of um, uh, like live the difficult life. And to some extent, I find a commonality um, between uh, Rose Auslander oh, okay. uh, and Alejandra Pizarnik's reflection in their expressionist, surrealistic imageries and surreal thinking way of thinking uh, and they underline language issues like uh, the language um, is uh, as i mentioned uh, the lang uh, language is um, a basis for the uh, reflections uh, however on the uh, on one hand <clears throat> alejandra's boundless hope highly artistically articulated in the image of phoenix contrasts sharply with bizarnik's archer um, uh, 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 immense despair and in this record, Auslander is, uh, is closer uh, to the vitality of Zuzana Ginchanka's poetry, who rejoices in life and youthhood um, under threat and in uh, anticipation of death. So on the other hand, they both speak much about the Holocaust as uh, the eyewitness, eyewitnesses and victims of it. And the affinities of all three are manifested in mortal themes, painful attitude, uh, to their Jewish roots and Jewish culture and the connection with their native land, uh, the feeling of rootlessness, and of course, uh, the reflection of their um, female identities, their um, being of a woman, their womanhood. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, I very much hope that um, all that has been done uh, has been said um, uh, so was somewhat uh, uh, I don't know helpful, interesting, and thought provoking for you. And I appreciate your watching and listening and your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. It was really engaging and uh, gave a lot of thoughts and uh, reflection uh, for me personally, and th I think for others as well. And uh, uh, do I understand correctly that we have no time for questions? We have no, not a single one. Uh, do we have a few minutes for questions or you are in a hurry? I'm in a hurry, but uh, I think I, I can uh, answer a few. Okay, so some short questions from the audience. Does anybody have? No? Well, if only a short uh, question, then uh, just I wanted to ask uh, this memorial to uh, Rose Auslander. It's uh, in Chivnivtsi. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay, just uh, then a short question. Uh, thank you, by the way, Christina, for the for sharing the knowledge. It was very useful and interesting. Uh, this memorial to Rose Auslander, uh, it's in Chivnivtsi or where? Yes. <clears throat> it's a journey. <clears throat> uh, a bit longer question, but it's uh, if you don't have a lot of time, that's that's all. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you again for sharing this. And I have also a short question. Do you hear me? Can you hear me? Poorly. Poorly. <laughs> I have some uh, some issues with my sound, so. Uh... Oh, I so yes. Uh, I'm also very thankful for your presentation, and, and it uh, it made me 
more interested into into the poetry of those three poetesses. Uh, and I'm wondering, you were, as you demonstrated, they both had connection with Jewish culture, and especially say Rosa in Rosa's Rosa Sanders case with uh, mother tongue. So I'm just wondering, has she left something, some texts or maybe poems written in Yiddish? Mm. Uh, for instance, Zuzanna um, uh, didn't know, uh, didn't speak Yiddish, only Russian and Polish. So it's uh, like um, a bit difficult uh, question because uh, um, as they uh, we are Jews and uh, they uh, felt this connection with the Jewish culture, but at the same time it, it was uh, quite difficult. And uh, um, in, in case of uh, Alejandra Pizarnik. Um, uh, she spoke uh, Spanish. She spoke, I, I think, she spoke uh, different languages. Uh, but um, we have no uh, evidence uh, of uh, uh, the uh, this language connection with Yiddish. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Thank it is uh, what it is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again. So. Uh, Hope we will hear you, see you here in Ukraine. Uh, stay safe and uh, 